dry cove was cradled beneath the towering white pines and mighty chestnuts of Thunderhead Mountain. The land here was rugged as the souls who called it home, hard-working folks who were just as in tune with the forest as the animals that inhabited them. Among these souls were the Harpers, a family that had called Dry Cove home since their Scotch-Irish ancestors first cleared the land four generations ago. Cora Harper stood at the edge of the woods, her gaze lingering on the trail that led bound to their modest homestead. The cabin, with its smoke curling lazily from the chimney, had once been a haven of laughter and warmth. Now it stood as a somber sentinel against the winter's chill. You see, the winter of 1894 had been cruel, not just for its biting winds, but for the typhoid fever that had swept through the valley, claiming her own mama's life. Her mother, Desi, had been the heart of their home, a gentle mountain woman who soothed the rough edges of their hard life. But ever since she passed, the silence in the cabin had been oppressive, as if the mountains themselves were still mourning her absence. Cora's father, Isaac, was once a stalwart mountaineer who ran the saw down at Hawkins Lumber Camp with a steady hand. But now, he was a shadow of his former self. Since Desi's death, he had been searching for answers in the bottom of an empty whiskey bottle, drawing him further away from his children, who needed him more than ever afore. Cora, at 16 years old, had inherited her mother's place in the home overnight. Her days were now a relentless cycle of chores, fetching water from the creek and tending to her four younger siblings and doing her best to cook meals that could fill the emptiness that had settled in their bellies and their hearts. The weight of her newfound responsibilities were as real as the cold that seeped through the chinkin' in the cabin walls. And the children, oh, they were too young to fully grasp the loss of their mother, and they often asked, when Mama was coming back home, and each time a fresh wound would open in Cora's heart. Little Emma, the youngest of the four, still left plates of cornbread by the fireplace, a ritual that her Mama had cherished, believing that it would bring good spirits. Winter gave way to the reluctant spring, but the frost within Isaac's soul hardened. Many days, he never came home, leaving his children to fend for themselves. And when he did return, his bourbon breath was as strong as gasoline, and it seemed to fuel the rage that he had inside. His face more hollow, his eyes more distant. He stood frozen at the threshold of the door, a man caught between one and the inner and needing to leave. Cora. He started his voice a rough whisper, yet the words faltered. Cora looked up. Yes, Paul. Isaac's gaze then drifted to the small figures that were huddled underneath the quilt, and then back to his oldest daughter, whose eyes mirrored her mother's so closely. His heart was full of sorrow, raw and sharp, and it seemed to sober him momentarily. He stepped inside, closing the door against the chill, his next words carrying the weight of unsaid apologies. We need more wood. He said simply, breaking the long silence, not with what he needs to say, but with the only words that he could manage. Cora nodded, setting the quilt aside. Yes, sir. I'll see to it in the morning, Paul. And as Isaac retreated to the shadows of the cabin, Cora's thoughts lingered back to her mama. The loss was devastating, and the future of the Harper family was more uncertain than ever before. Yet, something inside of Cora began to kindle, and the quiet resolve of the young mountain girl, who was learning all too quickly what it meant to stand firm in the face of life's relentless trials. Before long, Spring unfurled its tentative greens and golds across the slopes of Dry Cove. 
Still, the morning air was crisp as Cora stepped outside, with a bucket in each hand, down a worn dirt path that led to Mossy Creek a quarter of a mile from her home. At 16, Cora's frame was slight, but her shoulders bore the weight of her new life. Mossy Creek was a solitary place that Dawn, the steady rush of water over the stones, spoke in hushed tones. As she filled the buckets, she allowed herself a moment to watch a leaf fall from the safety of an elm tree and softly land atop the water. Thrust into this new, unforeseen trial, she watched as the leaf navigated its way over the rocks, swirling and bobbing, trying to stay afloat. Cora pondered the ease at which the leaf had found direction, and she wondered if this was something she could ever emulate. Back at the cabin, Isaac had become a stranger, with his presence more noted than his absences. And when he did appear, his eyes were always bloodshot, his temper quick, and his words short, and the smell of whiskey clung to him like a second skin. Truth be told, it had been this way all winter, and most of the spring, and now the strain was beginning to show. To make matters worse, two times last week, Mr. Jenkins, the owner of the local general store, had brought Isaac home in the back of his wagon, passed out drunk. Isaac's condition worsened. Once a strong mountaineer, forged by the years of logging, he was now a shadow of himself, crippled by the dual burdens of grief and alcohol. And by now, all of Dry Cove knew that Isaac Harper was a broken man. These past few months had hastened Cora into adulthood, and today was no different as she pulled garden weeds from the tater patch under the hot sun. Just then, her younger brother Samuel came running, with fear written all over his face. Cora, it's Paul, he gasped, struggling to catch his breath. At, at, at the camp, there's been an accident. Dropping her tools, Cora's heart lurched, and in an instant, she ran towards the lumber camp. And as they approached, the sounds of commotion and chaos could be heard as workers gathered in a chaotic cluster, each of their faces etched with concern. Breaking through the crowd, Cora's gaze fell upon Isaac, lying motionless beneath the shadow of a massive, fallen pine tree. Her breath was caught in her throat at the mere sight. Several men were already working to lift the heavy trunk, but they couldn't budge it. Help's coming, just hang on, Isaac, one of the men shouted. Cora knelt beside her father, her hands trembling as she took in his ashen face and his closed eyes. Fear gripped her heart. The reality of potentially losing him, too, was a blow she wasn't prepared to face. Moments later, several more men arrived, and, with a collective heave, the log was lifted and Isaac was gently pulled free. But his legs were caught badly, and blood was seeping through his overalls. Yet, back then, there wasn't a such thing as a hospital. So, they carried Isaac back home to the cabin, where the mountain dock was already waiting. He'll live, he told Cora, but it's gonna be a long recovery. Now, I know he ain't been the best father lately, and I know you're carrying a heavy load, child, but your pa needs you youngins more than ever afore. That night, as Cora sat by her father's side, the weight of the world seemed to crush down on her. So she stepped outside on the porch for a breath of air and a cool breeze. There she stood, looking up at the starlit sky. She felt an overwhelming sense of isolation. She had never felt so helpless and alone. Her knees gave way, and she sank to the ground, her tears finally breaking free. Why, Mother, she cried out into the darkness. How can I do this alone? It was there, under the dark night sky, that Cora nearly gave up. You're watching the Appalachia Channel. In the weeks that followed, Isaac was bedridden and racked with pain. He was also forced into a sobriety that brought clarity and regret. His physical injuries were healing, albeit slowly, but the wounds within, his guilt over his neglect 
and the grief that had driven him to the bottle were much harder to mend. One afternoon, as the heat of the day began to wane, Isaac called Cora to his bedside. His voice was weak. Cora, I've been thinking um, about how things have been and how I've been. And I ain't been much of a part of y'all. And for that, I'm truly sorry. And I know I can't undo all the hurt I've caused you. I let you down when you needed me the most. And losing your mom, no, it ripped my soul out. And I tried to flood that emptiness with whiskey. And now I see that I almost lost you in that flood. And the truth is, if the good Lord hadn't laid that tree down on me, I would have. But he busted me up pretty good, trying to wake me up before it was too late. And I'm awake now. And I see all you've done. You're as fine a daughter as any man could ever hope for. And your mama, oh, she would be so proud of you. And I know she's looking down on you now. I can see her spirit in your eyes. Cora, I know I ain't said it nearly enough, but I love you. And I hope you can find it in your heart to give me another chance. I promise you this, I'll never drink another drop. And I'm going to do my very best to be the paw that you deserve. <laughs>